I'm Ann Ongsted, and um, someone that helps me with paperwork, because I'm very bad with paperwork, said, why do you do SARE grants? And Matthew, would you stand up for me? I do it because um, even though I'm getting old, other people are still growing organic crops, and I do it for the next generations. My name is Steve Zwinger, and I'm part of the uh, Farm Breeder Club, and also an employee at the NDSU Carrington Research Extension Center. And, uh, okay, so. Basically, why did we work with buckwheat? Why do we use buckwheat? Well, it's a very important crop, um, particularly for sustainable organic agriculture, and, and because of some of its unique attributes, particularly how it, it, it mellows the soil, uh, makes a you know, nice texture to it. Um, it releases phosphorus, making our, our soils are loaded with uh, phosphorus that's not available, and buckwheat is one of the unique crops that is able to extract this insoluble phosphorus and make it available to the plant. So that's really a uh, very positive a uh, aspect, particularly since there are not many crops that are, that are like that. Um, basically, it's so competitive that it smothers weeds, so it's an excellent um, smother crop. It grows very fast, and you know usually weeds are never an issue with this particular crop, and it protects the soil as we use it for a cover crop and other things. Particularly since we can plant it in the warm part of the year and get that soil covered up and protected, so um, it's very important that way. And also from particularly from the marketing standpoint, um, buckwheat is an important crop, though worldwide you know the acreage is small, but it's still an important crop, and and uh, um, we don't eat it as much in the United States as other countries do, but it, you know, we, we market and grow this for as, as, a, as a human food, and then also we can be growing this as a seed crop, which uh, again I think is an important aspect of this whole thing, and that's partially what we're looking for in this project. And again, I think there are a couple of, there are a couple of points that I, I really feel are strong about buckwheat that we really need to consider, particularly for the future of agriculture. There's not a lot, we're losing, I mean, you can't help but notice nowadays in so many areas we're talking pollinators. You know, NRCS, everybody's talking pollinators. Very important, we know that. Well, I think buckwheat is one of our crops because it, it flowers uh, basically 30 days after you plant it up until you, it free, you freeze it, if the frost comes or you swath it. And so we have this long flower window, which is an excellent habitat for our pollinators. And I think that's a really important aspect. Um, and also, again, the cover crop use, because we can, we can plant this, uh, get some fast growth, turn it under, and, and possibly even seed another cover crop within that year. So, I mean, I, I think it has a lot of aspects um, uh, with, with that in the cover crop. Probably one of the more unique um, aspects of buckwheat is there are very few varieties, very few breeding programs, particularly public breeding programs. There are none. And, um, we really have a lack of varieties, particularly in North America. And so um, we're really looking at varieties that came out of uh, breeding programs uh, in, in Canada that are, you know, 30 years old. And so we have not seen any new development with varieties and stuff like that. And what we do have for newly developed varieties, which there are some going on, which is really a remnant of the same breeding programs, they're proprietary lines, meaning the companies that you uh, sign a contract with the market provide the seed and you have to sell all that seed back to them. So therefore, access to these new varieties is limited unless you are going to uh, form a contract with these particular companies. And so it's, it's really hard to, to you know, have a, uh, access to new varieties again and, and, and limited varieties. And so um, that can pose a, 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 obviously a problem for, uh, for, for, for farmers and, and agriculture. So really, this is what the project is about then, is to look at some new varieties of buckwheat, particularly they come out of uh, Ukraine or their Russian uh, varieties from that breeding program. And we're, we want to look at these, we, the object was to look at these varieties and compare them to the characteristics of the varieties we're growing and see how, uh, how they do uh, in, in terms of uh, research trials and comparing them, and then increase some of the seed and hopefully make the seed available to farmers if it does, if these varieties look like they'll perform. Um, so, and, and the, one of the things that's unique about these varieties is that, as we all know, buckwheat, as I said, will flower for long um, periods. Basically, they're, they're, they're uh, indeterminate plants, meaning they'll keep flowering until it's either the frost or you cut them. These newer buckwheat varieties that they're developing are more um, 
indeterminate, meaning they will um, uh, have a shorter or more concise flowering and ripening periods, and um, and and we did see that that they are they are short. You know, they they uh, won't flower as a longer time period and have more uniform set. But with that goes other characteristics like they probably don't get as tall, don't produce as much leaf area and such. And so there are positive and negative attributes in that and that's what we really want to look at and, and, and compare these, um, these varieties. So this was a farmer rancher grant and we had three farmers involved in this along with some researchers and, and, and outreach on it. So the farmers, Ann Ong said as you met her, was, was the project leader on this. And she's at Robinson and Rick Mitleider, which is about you know uh, 30, 40 miles away from Ann's farm, and at Tappan and Wayne Mitleider were also uh, project um, partners on this as farmers. We did look at um, trying to get some uh, regional you know uh, data on this, not just in North Dakota. So we we combined with other researchers, Carmen Fernholtz at the University of Minnesota, Pat Carr at 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 Dickinson, and we had a site at the Carrington, that would be me, Steve Zwinger. And then also we went out to with uh, Kevin Murphy at Washington State University, who is starting um, some, to do some breeding work in, in buckwheat and quinoa and other crops. And then the outreach component, um, uh, Teresa Podal and Frank Cut Kutka from the Farm Breeder Club were, were working on the outreach portion and, and assisting in that. So we kind of had a, you know, a, a wide array of, of people involved in this project. <laughs> So basically, it was a two-year project. This was the timeline. In 2013, we received um, very small amounts of seed of each one of these varieties. And, and basically, what we had to do then uh, was increase those before we could even get to the variety trials. So the first year was to increase these two varieties in isolation and then also have a field tour for uh, uh, awareness and spreading what we're doing. So then, we increased some of the seed in 2013. What happened, we come down to two 2014, again, had a field tour. We did variety trials at multiple locations. Everything doesn't always work out the way you want, and that's what we're starting to learn, which is okay. Um, so we didn't get as quite all the locations we wanted. We picked up some other ones. Sometimes it was miscommunication. Uh, in case of Carmen, he was uh, under the understanding that this was going to be field scale. And so then when we told him, no, we only have a pound of seed, you know, uh, it didn't work out because it does take specialized equipment to do this kind of work. So we were not able to get a Minnesota site. And the guy sending the seed, myself, missed sending seed to Pat, so we lost that site. But we did get, um, we did get uh, Kevin had a couple sites out in Washington. Um, we had three sites uh, planted on each one of the farms, uh, a couple sites up at Carrington, and then also we did get one other, um, uh, Bert and Johnson at, down in, in, in Fargo planted, uh, planted a trial too. So we did get a, you know, a number of locations. What we needed to do then also again was, you know, we did have enough seed to get into the trials, but the idea was then to take the seed that we increased and go further so that we could you know, get up enough seeds so that we, a farmer could plant it with large scale equipment. And then the object would be then after we increase that seed to distribute this seed to make it available to farmers. That was what the outline of the project was. Okay, the varieties. Um, I don't know how many of you read Russian, I don't. Um, but I really, Frank made these slides, these two slides for me and it was pretty good and I think I really appreciate that because I don't always pronounce words right. I don't even say Frank's name right sometimes. But I like the way he did this, I finally can say it. I used to, I called it Dicule, but it's Dicule, right? Dicule. That was, that was one of the varieties, and that's the Russian, obviously, but that's the one variety. Devyatka. Did I say it right? Yes. All right. So I guess that, that kind of helps us there. So those are the two variety names. Obviously, they are Russian. So here's what we did. In 2000, 2013, the, we, the Dev, Devyatka increase was on Ann's farm planted here, we only had 600 grams of seed. That's like a pound and a half. So what we were able to do, this is our little drill. These are seven inch rows and the drill does um, seven rows. Usually we put the winter wheat down there in the middle so we can help divide them in between the way we have to do it. And so basically we planted three of these strips 100 feet long. And um, this was again on Ann's farm. We, so we sold them on June 12th. It was swathed on August 27th and then harvested on the 3rd of September. From those 600 grams, we got 55 pounds of seed, 
which I thought that was pretty good. The interesting thing about it is um, I also had some uh, small grain plots on the same location. And we, were, we went down one week to combine the first set. And yeah, looked at the buckwheat. Oh, it's really flowering. Got a ways to go. Went down the next week, and I should have brought I don't really have a swather. I use a jerry mower to cut it, which is still like a swather. So I should have brought I couldn't believe it. Within one week, it was done flowering. It was ready to cut already. And I, I just never saw buckwheat mature so fast like that. And so then we obviously had to go home, make another trip down, and cut that buckwheat. And, uh, and again, so we, we harvested that. Everything really went good. I mean, that's a pretty... That's not a very long time period, and I, you know, like I said, that was a lot of seed that was pretty high quality, very little clean out, so it was all good heavy test weight seed. The dicule increase we did at Rick's farm, we had actually a thousand grams of seed there, so we had a 300 foot strip. Um, again, we sold them the same day. Um, we swathed a little later, not necessarily, I can't make a good handle if it was because of that variety is later in maturity or not, but it was a different field. But this one, um, as Frank says, I think we hit three of the seven plagues on this one. Um, it, it was, it was, it was uh, basically, it was a droughty year, so we had very little growth. Then hail came, and then there wasn't a whole lot left, but the plants were still growing, and then the grasshoppers came in. So it really got hit with everything. But we looked at that and just thought we had to harvest it. So. Basically, we went out and found whatever plants we could, cut them, took them home, dried them on a tarp, and then um, shelled them out just to have some seed to keep this project going. So basically, we, uh, we, we sowed 1,000 grams and came back with 700. So uh, you know, we don't want that to happen too often. <laughs> Saves on the trucking, but. Um, so we did, didn't have a good experience with that, but we did have some seed. Okay, Kevin Murphy, again, what we did, and it was very small amounts, we looked at as him being part of the project in another environment, we sent him, I mean, like 50 grams of the seed for a backup increase, and he increased those in 2013, so that he, you know, had a little bit more seed to plant in the plots and stuff like that. So um, we were kind of successful there. On, and I don't know the exact amounts. We have not got all our information from Kevin yet, but that's Kevin, and he is actually, um, he is a wheat breeder, I believe we've, we've had him at our conference, that's right. And, but what he's doing is he's seeing, um, as he says, the writing on the wall and where it's going. So he started looking at other things. So he's breeding like quinoa, um, I think spelt, uh, am, uh, buckwheat, you know, and so looking at other crops, which is great because like I said, there is not really much for breeders in this particular crop. So in 2013, this was the buckwheat trial up at the Carrington Center. Um, Ann and Rick here were presenting on that. Ann was talking about the project. And Rick um, is, is basically telling us the importance of buckwheat in his rotation and how it works, because it's an important crop for him. And, uh, and so we, did, we finished that year. We had, we had some seed. It's a new year, 2014. Here we're seeding. Um, the Deviatka increase down at Rick's, remember we had 55 pounds of seed. Some of it went into variety trials, we saved a little bit, and we put the rest in the ground here. We, we sowed uh, just about an acre of seed down there at Rick's. It was, this was quite late when we seeded it, because it was really, really dry, so we waited till it finally rained. And we went into his cover crop field here is what it was, and it was dissed. And um, again, the, the soils are light and sandy, so it was, it was uh, the soil was pretty loose, and essentially what happened, oh, there's the seed. So you'll notice this isn't dark seed like the newer buckwheat varieties we have. Um, it, but it does have a good test weight. This was heavy test weight seed. And so that, that's that uh, w their little drill that we were seeding there. But we did, have a, we did have a failure. We didn't get any seed off this. And part of it was, was because, again, um, in the systems that where Rick is doing this, whether it's plowing or disking, in this case he disked, but generally there's always a packer. Well, we didn't have a packer, so the soil was fairly loose. And also, we're not using a drill like a press, quite like a Kirschman press drill, which would do a better job of not getting the big um, uh, trenches when you seed. So when it was loose with this single, with this single um, press wheel, we tend to get these, you know, divots like you, you can all the time. And I know when we seeded it, we had, uh, 
you know, the seed was just really shallow, but we had it like this, and, I, and we stood there and, and uh, said, God, I don't know, I don't like that. And Rick says, well, it always, it's okay, just as long as it doesn't rain hard. Guess what happened that night? <laughs> A five-inch rain. <clears throat> and so our seed that was one inch was now four inches deep. And so essentially, you know, that was just one of the, one of the things that didn't work. <laughs> So, we lost all that seed. We had a dicule increase. Because um, remember now, we had very little seed of that. And this was only 400 grams sown on this. And actually, um, <coughs> I sowed this on my farm. Um, about a 200 foot strip, seeded it fairly thin. Um, but it was really interesting, you know, no comparison again. You're not having the varieties beside each other, so it's hard to compare. But I have never seen buckwheat grow so fast as that did. It was flowering by July 5th, which is only 28 days. And when it started flowering, it was up to here already in, th in 30 days. But guess what happened on July 22nd after it got this tall? I had a storm come through. And what happened is it just took and laid it all flat. So these four foot plants or three and a half foot were you know, over there. So there was this really wide strip and I thought, oh, what's going to happen now? But it did, it never stood back up. But what happened is, is you know how when plants lodge, it started growing back up. So it actually looked like at September 3rd, well, I was going to swath it on September 4th, it looked like a three foot buckwheat stand. It was pretty good. So they curved back up in that new growth and then, you know, so it was like this. And yeah, a hailstorm come through, and I'll have a cover crop next year. <laughs> and so w w we lost it all. And so it um, uh, doesn't work out all the way we want everything. So, but we were, this year we seeded variety trials on, on a few number of farms. So here we're down, we're seeding, uh, this is on Wayne's place, I believe, right close to Rick's. But we're seeding our variety trial again with our specialized drill so that we can drop the individual packets in and they seed out so they can keep switching. And again, we had a field tour. Uh, standing here in front of the buckwheat trial, here's one of the varieties, Dev Deviatka, you can see. We'll show a better picture of it. But again, Rick is, Rick is talking about the importance of, of buckwheat and how it works on his farm. So here is the variety trial at the Carrington site. This is the organic variety trial. Um, We'll go over some data and stuff here a little bit later, but I just want to show you here. You can see how much earlier flowering this one is. And again, for all of you that, <clears throat> if you don't know how our variety trials work and stuff like that, if you'll notice, these are replicates and there's a gap in there. That's why we need the drill to clean out on there. But it's pretty easy to see. Here it is on that rep. There it is there. There it is there. There it is there. Kind of sticks out when you got one like that, doesn't it? But you'll, you'll, you'll notice, though, how much earlier flowering that one was and, and that, you know, synchronicity of that. Um, in particular, as compared to, like, say, Springfield there, which is one of the later ones and the, the one next door. And we'll go over some of that here. But So here's the good part, the data. So this is the data from the variety trial this year. This is the three, three different locations make up these numbers. So we had a three-site average. This is the days to bloom. So if we look at this, you know, manor is probably the variety most of you are all planting if you're planting buckwheat. Um, you may be planting uh, maybe coma or kodo, but, you know, this is probably the variety that we're planting. Um, but if you look at that, look at those flower periods. Um, Deviatka, you can see there, is right at 30 days as compared to, you know, like um, Horizon, which is the latest one, you know, six days later. You know, that doesn't seem like a lot, but that's pretty big on buckwheat. So we can see that there's, it's much earlier at flowering and, and making a much more uniform set. But again, as I, as I, as I told you, the idea in the, in the development of these varieties is to make them so that they are um, faster flowering and faster seed set, but also have less, less leaf area and, and also not as tall. So you can see that shows up here. <clears throat> this is plant height in inches. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can see that they're the, they're the shortest varieties or as com in comparison there. Um, test weight is an important factor in marketing your buckwheat. And if we look at, again, if we look at these now, I'll use an example here. Manor is the old variety. 
that is, is being planted. The Kodo and Como are some newer varieties that Mindac has the rights to and developed. And the unique thing about this is, is what they have done in their breeding work is they, they have, it, it, these varieties tend to be much darker seed and have a heavier test weights. And you can see that shows up there. You know, there's some of the best, uh, particularly Como, there is the highest test weight, 47 pounds. Um, but Dev, Deviatka there does have a fairly decent test weight. We can still see, even though, you know, we have lighter colored seed, we're still getting a better test weight than the variety that we're planting. So that's an important character, particularly for your marketing aspect. Heavier test weight means a bigger growth, and that's what they want when they, after they dehull that. Another factor that hasn't been looked at as much, as much, but one of the things that we wanted to start doing is looking at the, the kernel weight. Because test weight and kernel weight aren't always the same. If you notice, if we go back, the heaviest test weights, Como, <coughs> Kodo, aren't necessarily having the largest kernel weight. TKW means 1,000 kernel weight, so that's the weight of 1,000 seeds in grams. But that, that's an, just another, another characteristic you look at to, to determine how, how heavy the seed is. Here's the part we're all interested in, though, the yield. Um, there are not big differences, as you can see, um, but the the Deviatka was basically the second lowest yielding. Not much really difference than Coleman, but you know, we, we didn't quite get the yield, and that's a lot of it obviously to do with its maturity, you know, where you just can't put it on. I think the, um, the one thing that makes me feel pretty good as I look at this, again, if we look at our yields, I mean, really this is only 20, you know, this is only uh, 25 pounds difference, so the scale looks like, but what makes you feel good is that at least the variety we're planting is still performing to the newer developed varieties, such as AC Springfield and Horizon are a couple of newer lines that have been developed by a company um, called Springfield Mills in Canada, who will be buying buckwheat from some of you now this year, because he told me he is gonna start contracting with organic farmers here. So that would be one access to some of those newer varieties. So, where do we go from here? Um, what we don't have a lot of seed. I mean, we still have remnant seeds that we can increase, but it's like starting over. Part of the grant, the idea was when once we produce the seed, the grant would buy the seed so that then that could be distributed to farmers. Well, we don't have seed to sell, but we have funds left. And so what we're doing is we're looking at is there a way that maybe we could take some of these funds and go to the Ukraine or Russia and purchase seed so that we could be where we want? So that's kind of where we're at right now with looking, do we want to purchase some of this seed or do we continue increasing it and get back to where we were? So that's really where we're at and, and what, we, what, we, uh, what we want to do. So. This is why buckwheat is important. When you look at, you know, when you look at it, what it does in a field and, and that effect in terms of no weeds, we're getting this crop to, uh, uh, to, to pull up phosphorus, which is probably going to be our, which is our most limiting nutrient in agriculture in the world right now. There's only so much phosphorus. So I think that's why that crop is so important, you know. And there is some, um, there is some evidence, and it's on the early stages, and this is actually work that's being done in, in Canada with Springfield Mills, um, to where they haven't had all the funds to continue working on us, but they've been working it for a while. They're actually finding on some of the buckwheat lines that um, buckwheat helps with uh, many of our current health problems, the heart um, and other things like diabetes and stuff. Thank you. And so um, there may be some future if some of this work can be continued to look at how it, actually buckwheat may have some uh, excellent uh, medicinal properties to help us with, with some of our, our health problems. But I think no matter what, in particular for the organic farmer, buckwheat is a very important crop 
but yet with the limited number of varieties, this is why it's so important to do what we're doing. I really believe that, and to try to um, find new, new, uh, new varieties that will help us and that will, will have seed that's open genetics that can be sold amongst farmers instead of having proprietary lines. So that's where buckwheat is kind of unique and that's why I think this project is really important so that we can see that. Um, because again, you know, looking at, looking at, look at all those flowers. You know, I mean, I know, I know D David right here at Podal has told me, because he plants buckwheat all the time. I believe you said your beekeeper likes to come into the buckwheat fields. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, this, it's really important. I mean, and also, too, I think when the more flowering plants we have in our farms, in our environment, then we create the habitat for more more pollinators and other things, which then will benefit all our crops. So having that you know, diversity out there and that flowering, that's so important. And that's, that's Ann's farm here, the Whitman Ranch. And again, buckwheat, very important crop for her. And with that, I guess we can probably take a couple questions. The question was, was the yielder lower, was the yield lower this year because the shortened flower period because of the weather conditions, right? That yeah, because of the weather conditions, conditions in that shortened flowering period. Um, boy, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know when we look at that, what really surprised us, and I know Frank said the same thing when we took that when we were at field day there, when we were looking at the Deviatka that day when it was flowering. We, this is it. We thought this was so great, but it, it probably was that shortened flower period. Now that you say it, because it probably didn't have enough to keep going because it kind of stopped where the other ones were still able to, to go. So your point is excellent there because I don't know that one of our advantages of buckwheat is that long flowering periods. So to shorten that up, is that exactly what, I don't know. but. Going back to the increase the year before on Ann's farm, which I wish I was watching it every day, which I didn't, you know how that goes, I totally thought, well, this is the best thing in the world because it was so fast and it was so easy to determine when to swath it and to not have any loss, you know? So there may be times, depending upon how the weather goes, that that might be advantageous to have that short period. That, that's the reason I asked the question because it, just looking at the other results on there, it tells you that agronomically there was potential to raise more so is it the shortened flowering period or is it the weather in that short right right period? yep I think it it could be both yes David I think one of the important things to assess as we assess these varieties more is keep temperature records because you know buckwheat is very sensitive to temperature and if the temperature gets above 90 the blossoms will blast and so are the Ukrainian varieties going to be more sensitive? I mean, is the plant going to compensate if the weather gets too hot and the flowers blast? Are they going to continue to flower? Or is it a terminant plant? Is that going to be more harmful to them? And I, and I think the bottom line on this whole thing is that's why you need to look at multiple years to ever to determine if a variety. So we, know we aren't totally there yet. Yes, Teresa. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember at the field day, <coughs> Steve, you and I talked about the advantages and disadvantages of determinate and indeterminate for exactly the reasons that, that um, Myron was talking here. But um, mm -hmm. the, the other piece of it that we probably need to do is planting based research, you know, as to with that particular with those. determinate variety, when do we actually need to plant them? I agree with that. I think that would be very big right there. With that, we'll have to close, and I thank you very much.